Yeah, Joachim Glesner is uh, a professor emeritus of political science, more specifically German politics at the Humboldt University of Berlin and the Institute of Social Sciences. Today's talk is entitled Reconstruction or a New Beginning, 30 Years of German Unification from a Micro Perspective, which um, we will be so thrilled to hear about also your personal experiences um, during unification. Um, Professor Glesner began his academic career focusing on a comparative look at communism. Um, in 1986, he became a professor of East German and West German, or as one might say, German-German politics at the Free University of Berlin. In 1992, he accepted a position as professor of German politics at the Humboldt University at the newly created Institute of Social Sciences. He continued his research on German and European politics, security issues, and civil liberties. Among his many publications, you can find much more online. He's the author of German Democracy from Post-World War II to the Present Day, um, and The Unification Process in Germany from Dictatorship to Democracy, which came out in 92. So those are, um, he's published a lot more before that and since, but those we wanted to mention um, with, because of their relevance for today's talk. Professor Glesner is one of the founders of the Transatlantic Master's Program, which many of you know well, um, as well as the Euro Master's Program the German-Turkish Master's Program, and the Berlin Graduate School of Social Sciences, which was funded by the DAD, the German Academic Exchange Council, as well as the Excellence Initiative by the German federal government. And an interesting note, um, as many of you know, King's College London is one of UNC's strategic partners, and the Glesna Collection um, is housed there. It's comprised of 20th century books, pamphlets, and serials from the library of Professor Glesna. And it has about 6,000 items in it. So the next time you're at King's, you can have a look. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. What I wanted to do today is not to repeat my paper. You could read it if you like. You can read it if you like. And, and I made some uh, more general and systematic remarks. In my paper, what I would like to do is to concentrate on the more informal aspects of uh, the German Revolution and German Unification, the years 1989 and 1990. I wish I were at UNC after more than 10 years, but uh, given the situation uh, as it is, Katie and I decided to change the format uh, of my presentation. So, where shall I start? Um, what I'm doing today is sort of transatlantic remarks uh, concerning my personal experiences. So not systematically, but what, how did I perceive and, uh, and uh, uh, how did I uh, see the developments uh, in 1990, 1989 and 1990? I have to say that in 1989, in April, I left Germany. I went to the UK and uh, afterwards to the University of Connecticut. And I came back at the end of October. So when I left in April, the GDR still existed as a, it seemed, st strong state run by a Communist Party. Uh, no problems whatsoever. When I came back, the leadership was was uh, ousted. Uh, the whole gen the whole uh, situation was absolutely unusual. Um, thousands of people took to the streets. The leadership was toppled. So nothing uh, reminded me of the place I left when uh, uh, when I went to the UK and the US. When I left in April, uh, there were some problems with small groups of people, very small groups, marginal groups of people who were demanding fundamental reforms, but they did not call for regime change. They did not call for a revolution. They simply wanted something like in the Soviet Union, Perestroika and Glasnost. So their, their uh, ideal uh, uh, perspective was to reform the GDR uh, like 
the Soviet Communist Party had started to reform the Soviet Union. Then came the 3rd and 4th of June uh, with the terrible massacre at Tiananmen Square in, in Beijing. And as to the GDR, it was very important that the deputy uh, head of state and, and, and the Communist Party, Egon Krenz, was in Beijing at that time. And he came back from Beijing and praised the response of the Communist Party of China vis-a-vis -vis the massive protest of people. The response was hundreds if not thousands of young people were massacred by, by the, the army and, and, and by tanks uh, the, the Communist Party sent into Beijing. So uh, something like a sword of Democles hang over the situation in the GDR when the situation became more, more unstable. These were alarm bells in so far as all the experiences uh, the GDR people and people in Eastern Europe had with reforms were not very positive. In 1953, an uprising in the GDR was crashed, crashed down by Soviet tanks. In 1956, Soviet tanks uh, 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 went into Hungary. 1968, uh, the uh, Velvet Revolution in uh, the Czechoslovak, uh, Czechoslovak Republic was crushed. So the experience was if we are going too far with what we are demanding, Soviet tanks would come in. And uh, Krenz's remarks as to the Tiananmen massacre were not very uh, positive. Um, nevertheless, during the summer, the opposition uh, rapidly gained support by the people. In August 89, uh, the borders between Hungary and uh, Austria were opened and thousands of people from the GDR tried to reach the West via Hungary and via the Czech Re Czechoslovak Republic. And the pressure on the party grew and grew and grew and nobody knew what, how, it would, uh, well, how it would end. Um, the situation in, 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 in Budapest at that time was something like in 2015, thousands of people camped at the main station in Budapest and wanted out. So in the end, uh, the, the Hungarian Communist Party opened the borders and the, peoples, uh, went, the people went to Austria uh, in, in their thousands. Um, so Hungary and the opening of the border was a sort of beginning of the end of the communist rule in most of the communist states and especially in the GDR. When I came back in October, Erich Honecker, the party leader, was ousted. On the 4th of November, more than 500,000 people gathered in the main square in East Berlin and they demanded the end of party rule, one party rule, they demanded free uh, elections. They demanded freedom of, uh, of opinion and free travel. So things they never dared to ask for in public. But there was no fear at that time anymore. And as you may know, just by, an, by accident, the border opened on the 9th of November and thousands and thousands of people went to the West. So, the interesting thing is, happily enough, there was no Tiananmen scenario in the GDR. The party did not call the army in, they did not call the, the secret police in, they did, didn't shoot uh, their own people. What happened was a peaceful revolution, a overthrow of the old regime, and no, no violence, neither on the, on the uh, side of the state nor on the side of uh, the protesters. What 
followed were five months, six months of tumultuous events in the GDR, which ended in on the 18th of March in free elections. And interestingly enough, the majority of the people voted for the Christian Democrats, the West German Com uh, uh, Conservative Party, and they voted not for a separate development of a free GDR, they want, voted for joining the Federal Republic as soon as possible. So the very basis for the discussion of the small opposition groups who were at the very beginning of all these historical events was pulled under their feet like a rug. Theoretically, at that time, there were two solutions available. Either a, I would call it post-revolutionary solution, which means building a new society, a new political order in its own rights. In the German case, it was difficult to, to imagine something like that because Germany was a divided country and uh, that would mean uh, people would have to develop a new separate political entity in Germany. But the majority of the people didn't want that. The majority of the people wanted to join the Federal Republic as soon as possible, as I said. The second solution was to dissolve the GDR as a state and to join the Federal Republic as the majority of the people wanted. The West German Constitution, the basic law of 1949, provided for such an accession of the GDR. There was an article which stated, for the time being, the ba this basic law shall apply to the territory of the lender, and then the 11 West German states were mentioned. In other parts of Germany, it shall be put into force on their accession. So there was a very clear and simple way to solve the problem, which, mean, which meant the GDR had to declare, we want to join the Federal Republic. That was it. Um, what did it mean? It, means that it meant that uh, joining the Federal Republic also meant joining the political institutional legal system of the Federal Republic and to adapt all the regulations uh, we had in the West. There was no third way, so to speak, something most of the op small opposition groups wanted when they started to oppose the SED Communist Party regime. It was not like uh, joining a new system or a re, um, no, sorry it was a situation which couldn't be uh, 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 compared to what happened after the civil war in the US where the confederate states had to rejoin the union and to adopt the regulations 13th amendment for example it was a possibility to declare we as the GDR are, want to join the Federal Republic and we accept all the regulations, especially the constitution of the Federal Republic. The GDR regime was not conquered by an external force. It was not uh, conquered by an alien from inside. It was a political revolution, a, re a regime change within the system, system itself. And joining the Federal Republic meant that all uh, the decisions which had to be made were now, from, from now on, uh, uh, dictated by the regulations of the Federal Republic. For example, the constitution was in place. The legal system had to be adopted. Political institutions had to be remodeled after the Western 
uh, uh, model. The second aspect is political economy. Uh, the old system was a communist system, state-owned and state-planned economy without private ownership of the mood of the production and well, it was abolished within a month and replaced by the capitalist market system. That meant that there was a total collapse of the former markets of the GDR, which were in the East, Eastern Europe and Soviet Union. And the GDR uh, had to reorient itself uh, uh, under the uh, uh, under the conditions of a free market economy. Uh, millions of people were laid off within two or three months. Specific qualifications were developed. So uh, this, the, the economic system of the GDR collapsed within two or three months. The capital stock of the GDR was out, far outdated and it was not competitive with uh, other economies in the West. The same holds to social uh, uh, and personal relations. Um, the social relations in the GDR were basically determined by the workplace, by the factory, by public administration, by educational institutions, cultural institutions. To give you one example, Humboldt University had its own a building cooperative where people uh, employed by the university could uh, get a, a flat or an apartment with other colleagues and they live together. Uh, uh, institutions like uh, Humboldt University or factories had their own kindergartens, they had their own uh, vacation facilities and so on and so forth. So social uh, uh, contacts were basically uh, determined by uh, the place where people lived and worked at. The moment they were laid off, all these social contacts and social, these social networks collapsed and they were restricted in, yeah, like, like ourselves today, you know, at home, not, not because of coronavirus, but because their, their social environment collapsed. Thirdly, and there uh, comes something in which I would like to uh, uh, explain a bit longer and more intensively, elite change. Um, in the Southern states of the USA, you uh, may know the, the term carpet beggars. These were the people who, the derogative term, uh, these were people who came from the northern states and made their fortune in the south. Um, something like that happened in Germany. There was a replacement of old elites in the GDR or the former GDR. They were replaced only partly by those who opposed the old system and triggered the public uprising in the first place. Civil rights activists were always a minority and the masses had totally different visions and political goals, as I already mentioned. They wanted to join the Federal Republic unconditionally. The mood of accession opened the gates for Western elites, businessmen, adventurers, and often uh, uh, adventurers often disguised as benevolent investors. So people from the West came into the East and try to make their fortune there, which is not immoral, but which is problematic for a society, which was more or less cut off, it's, uh, uh, or cut off from, from other influences outside, except uh, the Soviet Union or so. So people from the West took the opportunity of their lives and they opened businesses, uh, they applied for jobs in public administration and so on and so forth. There were other serious people who wanted to join a historic period of transition and democratization. So idealists who also went to the East. So a different kind of people who 
uh, came to the East uh, in, in a society which was not used to be confronted with other views, with views from outside their own society. Often, but not always, both groups were denounced as Vessis or Besser Vessis. Besser Vessis means those pretending to know better. And these were the equivalent for the carpet beggars. So there was a lot of resentment vis-a-vis -vis, uh, these people. And one aspect is, of very, uh, is very important that leading positions in public services, in regional government, CEOs of privatized uh, in industries, universities, institutions of higher education, etc. Most of these positions went to Westerners, professors included, and I'm one of them. So, in contrary to former dictatorships, let's say in Spain or Poland, in, in Portugal or wherever, in the German case, it was, not, it was not only regime change, it was a fundamental change of the economic, social conditions in which people lived. Their personal life was uh, often turned upside down and people from outside came in and made the, the, the decisive decisions for them. And this was not a situation where uh, people were open-minded vis-a-vis uh, -vis these newcomers and their uh, way to handle the situation. To give you an idea of the everyday problems of transition in a particularly institutional setting, I'd like to refer to some personal experience at Humboldt, as Katie has already, already mentioned. Humboldt formerly was the, the University of the GDR capital. And as a newly appointed political science professor who came from the West Berlin University, which was only 15 kilometers away, but another world, so to speak, I held a chair, a new chair on German politics. German politics, not West German politics. When I came to Humboldt, my first semester in summer 1992, two years after unification, I offered the lecture series on the history and current problems of the political system of the Federal Republic. And I was confronted with students who believed I were the Western equivalent of their former teachers of Marxism-Leninism presenting the official ideology of the new regime. That was the perception. As Katie already mentioned, I happened to be a specialist in communist systems and the GDR. So I thought I knew what these people were thinking of me and I had a rough assessment of how my East German students might uh, 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 deal with the situation. Nevertheless, I was surprised about the resistance I faced. What I taught was my own independent view on political and social problems based on empirical research and to the best of my knowledge, earnest consideration of different opinions and views among social scientists. Even today, I'm not sure whether I could convince my students in the first place. It took some time before we managed to trust each other. So what they were used to were professors who taught official opinions, be it in economy, be it in law, be it in, in, in social sciences. And they were not used to people like us who had very different uh, uh, opinions on different uh, topics and who tried to do their best to teach students how to deal with different opinions and how to make up their own opinion after serious considerations. The second aspect was a totally different understanding of the social role 
of professors in academia and in society as a whole. Most East German professors were dismissed, especially uh, those in ideologically vulnerable disciplines like philosophy or social sciences or law. The self perception of those who had a chance to stay, and there were some of them, differed from their Western colleagues. They saw themselves as public intellectuals who aimed to influence the political discourse as they tried to do in the old times, with little success, I must say. They didn't see themselves as social scientists in a Weberian sense. My Western colleagues and myself stood in the tradition of Max Weber. We tried to differentiate between our personal convictions, sometimes also preoccupations, idiosyncrasies, prejudgments, prejudices, and our scientific finding uh, uh, be presented to our students. And there was a different understanding of the role of the universities as an institution. Should university primarily be an institution for professional training of academically skilled white color workers for all sectors of society or an institution for science and knowledge driven education in the Humboldtian tradition based on the unity of teaching and research. This was very hard to understand for many of the students and for some of our East German colleagues too. And last but not least, universities in Germany, although they are mostly state financed, enjoy a high degree of independence from the state. The state only provides for the legal institutional framework and funding of state uh, in the state budget, but it is not allowed to intervene into teaching and research. Freedom of teaching is one of the basic rights guaranteed in the constitution. Art and science, research and teaching shall be free. This was obviously, obviously not the case in the GDR. So these are some of the differences one could uh, 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 see when you came to Humboldt and other colleagues who came to other East European, East German uh, universities. And it was very hard to deal with that. As for my East German students, uh, East German students, uh, they were uh, in a economically and socially very complicated situation. Their financial background was often very weak. They still had no state funding for their studies and they had to, uh, to uh, try to uh, make meets end every, every day and they had very little time to, to uh, engage in theoretical thinking and, and, and theories. They simply wanted to finish their studies and to have a chance to start a professional life. Let me leave it with that. Um, one aspect I would like to mention very briefly at the end. Citizens of the former GDR wanted a new system. They wanted to live like in the West. They didn't want and they didn't uh, uh, go for radical a transformation of the old political system, what, but what they experienced was a radical, a fundamental transition and transformation of their entire lives, personally, economically, uh, as to their jobs and so on and so forth. So their whole life was turned upside down. And this was something which the Western uh, part of Germany, the citizens in the West, didn't experience. And this still is the main difference in personal experiences over now 30 years or so. And some of the problems we witness today, uh, different political perspectives, different social behavior, uh, different expe expectations as to the role of the state and so on and so forth are still connected with these differences 
in social and personal experiences in a very tumultuous time uh, which lasted for one, two, three years and which is still not overcome. If you look at the history of the Federal Republic of Germany, if you look at the history of West Germany, you could find similar uh, developments. Uh, there was a very interesting study in the, mid, in the early 1960 conducted by Sidney Weber and, and uh, uh, um, by Sidney Weber and uh, Gabriel Almond uh, on uh, political culture. And what they experienced at that time was the West Germans were Democrats, formally. They voted for democratic parties. They did everything the democratic state wanted from them. But they were not convinced that democracy was something which had to do with their personal life. And this is something we could experience today, where many East Germans are Democrats. More than 80% vote for democratic parties. Only, only 20 to 25%, far too much for right-wing populist parties. But democracy as a part of everyday life and of personal engagement in social and cultural and, and political things is not as deep rooted as it is in the West. And there we still, we have to, um, tremendous differences between to the two parts of Germany. So in 1990, at breaknet break, break speed, two social orders with antagonistic political and economic and social systems were put together. But uh, the culture, the cultural background of the people in the West and in the East is still different. Thank you.